particular video, I'll share with you my eight intriguingly funny things about Idi Amin. This year, 2019, Uganda celebrates 57 years of independence on the 9th of October. But over the years, the country has had quite a number of leaders. Uganda had its first president after independence, and his name was Sir Edward Luangula Walugembe Mutesa II, who was also the king of Uganda by then. Mutesa II ruled Uganda from the 9th of October 1963 to the 2nd of March 1966. He was toppled by Dr. Apollo Milton Obote, who ruled the country from 15th April 1966 to the 25th of January 1971. And then we had Yusuf Chironde Lule, who ruled the country for the shortest period between the 13th of April 1979 to the 20th of June 1979. He was followed by quite an intellectual chap called Godfrey Lukonga Binaisa who was the president of Uganda from the 25th of June 1969 to the 12th of May 1980. And then we had the second regime of Dr. Apollo Milton Obote between the 17th of December 1980 to the 27th of July 1987. He was followed by Tito Okelo Lutwa, who was an army general. And this guy ruled Uganda between the 19th of July 1985 to the 26th of January 1986 when an energetic Yoweri Kakuta Museveni, the current president of Uganda, took over. Did I forget someone? Yes, Idi Amin ruled Uganda between the 25th of Jan 1971 and the 11th of April 1979. That was right after the first regime of Apollo Milton Obote and right before the regime of Yusuf Lule. Close to half a century ago in 1971, a leader infamous for the most rose to power and he would forever write his name in the books of African history. British politician David Owen once said he should have been assassinated. He was one of the worst of all African regimes. But when you go through vintage depths, you seem to see a fine line between fury and a man who loved his country, even if his pronunciation of a common phrase, Pearl of Africa, left you laughing. If they wanted Uganda to be called as a pill of Africa, as was said by uh, Sir, late Sir Winston Churchill. Most accounts reveal that he was born in Koboko to a Kakwa father and a Lugbara mother in 1925. This date is however quite confusing because some accounts point to 1923, while his son Hussein in an interview said his father was born in Kampala in 1928. If you do not know, Kakwa land is located in West Nile. Um, this is a section in the northwestern part of the country. The Kakwa are believed to be closely related to the Nubians of southern Sudan. Little is said about Idi Amin's dad, but some books show that like many African kids, he was abandoned by his father at a very tender age and he was raised by a single mother, a lady called Ate Asa. Duty of the woman is the housewoman. He knows how to keep house very well. If he can do that, let me make first examinations, appoint women to be the managers of hotel, which is done. I guess this also partly explains why you hear more about his mother who unfortunately died in 1970, just a year before he became president. Madame Asa raised Idi Amin in Kampala where she served as a traditional herbalist, a healer who served several royals in the Buganda Kingdom, the most predominant kingdom in Uganda. 
I guess this also partly explains the presence of a Nubian community in Kampala. We call them Aba Nubi. But all stories you read about Idi Amin show that he was not well educated. There was an outright lack of a decent form of education. And you could say that this is why he often did agree with the learned or call them the elites. You shouldn't. If you want, you come direct to Uganda and get your representative in Kampala so that he can give you accurate information. But I wanted to ask you, are you not afraid of uh, interviewing the conqueror of the British Empire as you are British? You are not afraid of... Everybody they loves me, and therefore I am one of their hero, the hero in the country, and therefore everybody is responsible for my security. I am not afraid because uh, I know exactly how and when I will die, this I know. When you study him really close and you read books of history, you'll know that even in his many flaws, there wasn't a lack for wisdom in the way he acted. In 1946, Idi Amin joined the Imperial British Army, the King's African Rifles. At this point, he only served as a, as a cook um, and when a time came when they needed an extra pair of boots, the man joined the army, quickly rising in the ranks to reach the title of Afande in 1959, which by then was the highest possible rank for a black African in the colonial British army. Idi Amin is recorded to have been a very devoted officer who executed all his tasks exceptionally. You are all right for your communication. Yes. Muton, Uganda did to make it 23. Yes, He fought for the British during the mission to Somalia and also fought during the Mau Mau rebellion. Idi Amin is also remembered for having participated in the quelling of the cattle rustling in Karamoja between the Karamajong community of northeastern Uganda and the Tukana nomads of western Kenya. Quite notably, Idi Amin was the commander-in-chief of Obote's army when Obote came into leadership. But most fascinating of all is that he deposed him in 1971 in a bloodless coup while Obote was attending a Commonwealth Heads of State Conference in Singapore. His reason for toppling Obote was that Obote was allying with his own tribesmen and forgetting or rather abandoning all other tribes in Uganda. The members of the Uganda Army and Air Force decided to take over from the civilian role because of the the last arrangement which were made by the Dr. Apollo Milton Obote to disarm the whole tribe of Uganda except his own tribe Langi and Acholi. I am not ambitious of standing for power but uh, my job is that uh, I want to hand over the government clean to the, somebody who is coming into power, hold these corruptions, and then when he comes, he will have a, a, a good, um, he, will, he will know everything, even I will brief him clearly, this is what we have got with the commission of inquiry report, and uh, how much he has got to hand clean the government to him. And that's what I, I, I want. And then I can go back to barracks. And uh, you will be surprised to see that I am first uh, uh, African uh, who is not ambitious to hand over power to person. And then 
take again order from him if I am still all right here you come back you will see that you come back when the uh, next man into power here you will see me I'm coming saluting him and obey his order but history books reveal that Amin was also in trouble and he knew that he was ripe for investigation uh, re reports have it that he had embezzled funds and when his cousin Isaac Maliamungu learned about Obote's plan to investigate Idi Amin, he informed Idi Amin. Maliamungu would later on become a brutal killing machine and the commander of Amin's army. There are a number of significant events that took place during Amin's tenure between 1971 and 1979. Quite significant was the 1972 economic war, which involved the famous August 1972 90-day ultimatum. This saw the exile of over 80,000 British Asians, most of whom had British passports but were born in Uganda. This, this is the paper, August 17th, all Asians must go. They were mainly Indians whose parents had been brought in by the British in the early years of colonial rule in Uganda. Idi Amin gave them 90 days, only 90 days, to leave Uganda. But he probably didn't know that they were the backbone of Uganda's economy. What will happen to these people? if they don't go by the time they do. I think they will be sitting like they are sitting on the fire. I will tell you this. You just wait after three months. What will you do to them? Okay, you will <laughs> see. <laughs> this was a move that was welcomed by many, especially those No, I wouldn't, because I, I, on this I, I'm saying, I'm saying it uh, in good faith, and I'm, this is the belief of the majority of the Ugandans. The Ugandans would rather suffer for two, three years more, and restore themselves to prosperity, than having Asian retailers coming back to manage their shops. I think, I think the only role some Asians could play uh, the role like uh, the Madhvani family, the, the sugar tycoons, like Mahandra Mehta family, you know, the big, big estates where they can really inject new capital into industry. I, I detest the method uh, he used to evict them. I think the method was barbarous, to say the least, but uh, I think the results which are achieved by using that kind of brutal method of evicting them is a, a, a point of no return uh, as far as uh, ordinary Ugandans are concerned. But it certainly awoke the spirit of entrepreneurship in the country. And then uh, significant event number two would be the raid on Entebbe. You'd want to go and watch the movies about that, but also visit the new museum that they're putting up at the old airport in Entebbe, where the event actually happened. So as we started out at the beginning of the video, I promised eight things that I find intriguingly interesting about Idi Amin. And here they are. Number one, Idi Amin had a very cute laugh. Okay, I'm just kidding about that one. <laughs> Number one is actually Idi Amin uh, 